Hello and welcome. I'm Valerie Paley, Senior Vice President and Sue Ann Weinberg Director of the Patricia D. Klingenstein Library at the New York Historical Society. I would like to begin by thanking Louise Mirror, our President and CEO, Agnes Su Tang, Chair of the Board of Trustees, and Pam Schaffler, our Chair Emerita, as well as all of our trustees, Joyce B. Cowan, Diane Max, and the late Adam Max, and the Mellon Foundation, along with our Chairman's Council, our members, and our many other generous donors, None of the work of New York Historical would be possible without your continued and committed support. I'm honored to be recognized as the founding director of our Center for Women's History, the first such center of its kind within the walls of a major museum in the United States. In only a few short years, we've been able to accomplish so much in terms of scholarship, education, programs, collecting, and not least of all, exhibitions, all of which foreground women's critical role in American history. Emblematic of that mission is tonight's program, Fierce and Fearless, Patsy Takemoto Mink, First Woman of Color in Congress. But beforehand, I'd like to acknowledge the outstanding work of our Center for Women's History colleague, Allison Surgery, who has produced our salon programs like this one, both on site and on Zoom since their inception five years ago. This will be Allie's last program as she moves on in her career away from New York Historical. She will be desperately missed. Tonight's program will last approximately 45 minutes, including 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end, which you can submit via the Q&A function on your Zoom screen at any point during the presentation. The chat function has been disabled, so please do make sure to use the Q&A. After the presentation, we will get to as many questions as time allows. And now I am delighted to introduce Karintha Lowe, one of our Mellon Predoctoral Fellows in Women's History, who helped spearhead the planning of tonight's conversation. Thank you, Valerie. Hello and welcome. I am honored to introduce today's speakers. Gwendolyn Mink is a policy scholar who writes about poverty policy, gender issues, and equality politics in the US. She is Patsy Mink's daughter. She was professor of politics at the University of California, Santa Cruz for 20 years, and the Charles Clark Professor of Women's Studies and Government at Smith College for seven years. Since 2008, she has been an independent scholar based in Washington, DC. Mink has written or edited 10 books, most recently Ensuring Poverty, Welfare Reform and Feminist Perspective, co-authored with Felicia Cornblue, and Fierce and Fearless, Patsy Takamoto Mink, First Woman of Color in Congress, co-authored with Judy Wu. Besides her scholarly pursuits, Mink is engaged in social justice initiatives, for 15 years, she sat on the board of the Institute for Public Accuracy, a media democracy project. She is now entering her 20th year as chair of the Patsy Takamoto Mink Education Foundation for Low Income Women and Children, a nonprofit organization that provides support to low income mothers who are pursuing education or training. Judy Wu is a professor of Asian American Studies at the University of California, Irvine, and the director of the Humanities Center. She authored Dr. Mom Chung of the Fair-Haired Bastards, The Life of a Wartime Celebrity, and Radicals on the Road, Internationalism, Orientalism, and Feminism During the Vietnam Era. She co-edited Women's America, Refocusing the Past, Gendering the Trans-Pacific World, and Frontiers, a Journal of Women's Studies. Currently, she is co-editor of Women and Social Movements in the United States, 1600 to 2000, and editor of the Amerasia Journal. She is co-president of the Berkshire Conference of Women's Historians. So welcome, Judy and Wendy. It is such an honor to have two such powerhouses of women's history here today to discuss the life and work of Patsy Mink. So for our audiences here today, I'll just quickly note that your book, Fierce and Fearless, is the first ever biography of Patsy Mink's life. And to tell her life story, you interweave Wendy's personal narratives of her mother's uh, life with Judy's historical analysis of Mink's career. To launch our discussion then, I just have sort of a quick baseline question, which is, you know, how did your partnership come to be? And what was it like to collaboratively write this biography? Thanks so much for in inviting us to this program, Karinza. I'm gonna turn this over to Wendy. She's, she's my elder in many, in all aspects. You're good. Well, I'm your elder on this project, maybe, in that I started uh, working in my mother's papers, which are at the Library of Congress, uh, probably around 2007, 2008, um, very unproductively. 
I, um, I puttered around the papers, tried to collect as many materials uh, digitally as I could that I thought would be relevant to putting together her story. Uh, started to sort of wet my toes in the secondary literature for each of the periods that um, we, or that I was contemplating writing about, but ultimately became stymied um, when I sat down to write because I couldn't decide what voice to write in and um, whether to write as a daughter or to write as a political scientist and policy historian. Um, I couldn't even decide what to call her, uh, whether I could refer to her as my mother or whether I had to refer to her as Mink, for example, in a much more clinical and dispassionate way. So uh, for a couple of years there, I continued to collect stuff and imagine uh, slightly memoirish ways of writing chapters, but then feeling discouraged because scholars were not interested in memoir. Uh, uh, basically, um, when all of a sudden the goddess, the stars, my mother's spirit visited to Washington, Professor Judy Wu from Ohio State at the time. And Judy can continue the story. I love that introduction, Wendy. And I apologize, <laughs> I'm in my home office and someone just started trying to print something. So if you hear a lot of whirling in the background, that's what it is. I started this project 10 years ago. All my book projects take 10 years. And in retrospect, I realized that perhaps the Library of Congress was featuring the Patsy Mink papers because it was the 40th anniversary of Title IX and she's a namesake for Title IX. And I remember looking, well, as a historian, you're, I'm always really excited when there's archives, especially when there's significant collection of archives. I didn't think I realized how significant because there's over 2000 boxes at the Library of Congress. And I remember thinking, why hasn't anybody written about Patsy Mink? She was the first, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit, right? The first woman of color in Congress, the first in so many ways. And uh, I remember even writing to my colleagues, like, is anybody working on her? Um, and to my surprise, nobody was. When I began research in Washington, everybody said, you need to talk to Wendy Mink. She's Patsy Mink's daughter. And Wendy was very gracious. I remember having many meals with her um, doing oral histories with her. But when I found out that her mother wanted Wendy to write her biography, it just made a lot of sense for us to collaborate with each other. And we did get some pushback from editors who wanted the more dispassionate, distant voice in writing the biography. But I, I think it's so important that our book features both of our voices and both of our perspectives. Um, I knew that Wendy felt a little bit stuck being both a daughter and a political scientist, but her story about not even knowing how to describe her mother, I think really you know, brings that home, right? Do you, does she talk about her as mom? Does she talk about her as if she's this historical subject, which she is, right? She's both. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be in dialogue with Wendy and to write with her. Definitely. I was struck by that, too, because when I sort of learned about Patsy Mink, I always hear her framed as the mother of Title IX. And so to sort of then have Wendy you reframe it in that way was already a really powerful kind of intro um, to her as well. And as Judy, you just mentioned, you know, we do tend to use a lot of firsts when we describe Patsy Mink, right? She was the first Japanese American woman in Hawaii to practice law, the first to run for and win a seat in the Hawaii legislature, and the first Asian American to run for US presidency in 1972, um, which was little news to me actually. So I loved reading about that as well. Um, so could you tell us a bit more about her early life and what set her on the path you know, to becoming the first woman of color in Congress? Wendy? You're deferring to me again. Well, you know, um, early life, I'm not sure, uh, well, certainly when she was a child, and a teenager, and even at the age of 20, which was how old she was when she started law school, I don't think she would have considered herself on a path to anywhere in particular, let alone to the United States Congress, and let alone to becoming the first of anything. But what set her on a path to politics is what I think set her on the path that eventuated in her 
uh, trailblazing um, election in 1964. What set her uh, on a path into politics, I think, was growing up in Hawaii, uh, surrounded by a vigorous labor movement, uh, surrounded by uh, the fallout from World War II and the uh, mistreatment, the abuse of the Japanese American community. Um, it uh, sort of played out further in the in the rise of McCarthyism, which sort of what arose simultaneous with her political sort of adulthood or coming into political adulthood in the late 40s and in the 19, early 1950s. Um, and I think that I guess also in college, she was politically engaged with questions of statehood, with debating great uh, sort of uh, social problems that were sort of uh, highlighted during the New Deal presidency of Franklin Roosevelt. Sort of all of those things created a, a, a consciousness in her towards social justice, towards mobilization, towards supporting movements, towards learning how to be an ally, uh, towards learning how to stand up uh, even against the grain. And ultimately it was those combination of factors that situated her in the mid to late 1950s in a politics of, of uh, opposition to nuclear testing and the politics of statehood and so forth that then uh, you know, put her on a path to uh, national elect electoral office. I'll just add maybe two things. One, I think her personal, in addition to her, her observation and her reflections about the politics of that time, um, I think it's also her personal experiences of being marginalized and being excluded that she initially wanted to be a doctor, was turned down from every single medical school um, in the aftermath of World War II and the return of GIs that she went to law school, could not find a job. She was a woman, she was a mother, she was Asian American. So I think these setbacks really personally fueled her desire to try to create a better society, to try to create in reality equal opportunity. So I think that's something that I see very clearly in her life experiences and how she translates that into a desire for, um, for political mobilization. But the other thing I was gonna mention, and this is at the later stage of her life, is that she just seems to be such a political being. And the years between when she was in Congress, so she was in Congress from 65 to 77, ran for the US Senate and did not succeed in that campaign. In fact, none of the women who ran for the US Senate succeeded in that campaign that year, which is really interesting, it's a US bicentennial. Um, so it says something about the state of gender politics, I think, in the United States. But she returned in 1990 and passed away in 2002 when she was still in office. And in fact, when she passed away, her constituency re-elected her anyway, right, as a sign of um, to how, how to honor her. Um, but that period between when she's in federal office, I just find it so interesting. She did a number of things, including serving in the State Department and also being president of Americans for Democratic Action. And, um, but she also just returned to local office. She was in Hawaii and ran for city council. And, and she was inspired by trying to create um, environmental justice basically for her community. And then she wanted to persist in many of the agenda items that she, was, she had been pursuing at the federal level, which included childcare, including trying to support um, and find resources and housing for people who are homeless. So I just, um, I just found that she was just at her heart, <laughs> such a political activist that it didn't matter in some ways which arena she was in, but she really wanted to pursue those goals. And she saw politics as a way to, to try to achieve these ideals. Right, and I think as you kind of bring up often in the book, one of the ways in which she's achieving these ideals is not solely on her own, right? She's also building sort of collaborative relationships um, across the board. And, you know, throughout her political tenure, she's working alongside congressional colleagues, especially the sort of few other women who are in the House and Senate. And she's also working with feminist activists, right? In order to advocate for environmental rights, women's rights, um, racial and economic justice. And so 
that really fascinated me as well, this sort of collaborative dimension of her political work. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about that and if there is you know, a particularly powerful partnership or friendship really that comes to mind when you think about her time on Capitol Hill. Judy, why don't you start with the first part of that question and I'll talk about the relationships that were pivotal. Sure. I think um, when we think about a biography of a historically significant individual, a lot of it is focused on that individual. And I think that also promotes this idea of a, a sort of the great leader, right? The kind of outstanding individual. And there were many ways in which Patsy Mink was outstanding, but her political commitments were towards other people who are also outsiders, right? Towards people who are impoverished, towards women, towards racialized um, and indigenized others. So I, I really wanted to emphasize that she was in Congress in a very unique position, but she was doing it in collaboration with social movement activists and community activists. And especially thinking about the time period in which she enters Congress, right? 65, it's at the height of the civil rights movement. Um, there's gonna be a continuing burgeoning women's movement, an anti-war movement, right? Other racial liberation movements, environmental movement. Um, and so she's really much, very much in conversation with these individuals and organizations and I see her working in partnership. Like she's, she's trying to decide, well, what are the best policy approaches? And so she's doing that in conversation with activist groups. They're also strategizing about who to lobby, who to who obtains allies, that you really need this type of grassroots mobilization um, in order to create social change. Um, and I, Wendy will talk a little bit more about her, the people that she tends to um, have strong relationships with. But I also just want to mention that Patsy Mink had a really strong sense of constituency service. So regardless of whether you were an activist or regardless of whether you supported um, her political vision, she wanted to support those people who put her in office. So I see a lot of correspondence from, from folks just saying, um, you know, fourth graders say, I'm gonna do a report on civics, will you send me some information? And she'll send information or someone writing to say, my family has this concern or issue. And so she would try to address those needs. Um, so I think she really, again, at her heart is really thinking about how she can be an advocate and a representative for the people who put her in office. Yeah, I don't think, uh, I think that's a, a beautiful description of her general approach and the sort of foundations of her collaborative work. If part of your question has to do with the nitty gritty of that work, of the relationships that made that work possible, um, I would point on the one hand to her, her sort of uh, vigilant uh, maintenance of connections with local groups in Hawaii, her constituency, um, as a sort of guiding uh, light for her, uh, the kinds of issues she wanted to bring to the table. Um, particularly for people who were not at the table, people who were historically marginalized or excluded and, and so forth. So that's one level. And, and those, the particular groups sort of would vary over time, right? And the saliency of, of different issues would uh, determine who she was working most closely with at, at any given moment. At the national or uh, sort of Washington level of uh, sort of policy imagination and policy development and uh, policy resistance in the case of the war in Vietnam. Um, there were several kind of mediating external institutions for the feminist movement. It was the rise of the National Organization for Women. It was the creation and development of the Women's Education, uh, Women's Equality Action League, WHEEL, um, and uh, other groups like that. And then later uh, the National Women's Political Caucus, which she helped to, to found. Um, so those were sort of referent groups and sort of uh, wellsprings of allies and ideas that she could um, work with. And also the Americans for Democratic Action with which she had a very close uh, relationship from the early 1960s forward. Uh, all the way through her first uh, set of terms in Congress, and then all, again through her second uh, set of terms in Congress. And with uh, 
with the ADA in particular, sort of issues of economic justice and also issues of war and peace were probably the most prominent in uh, forging and maintaining the, the bonds, the connections that um, helped to advocate for positions that were not popular um, in their day, right? They didn't become popular until a little bit later on and arguably economic justice never became popular, which is why we live in the world that we do today. Um, and then the sort of inside Congress itself is a whole nother world of questions of, of collaboration, of uh, mutual assistance legislatively. Um, and there uh, she sort of depended on a, on a handful of people, some of whom were white males in the anti-war legislative caucus, uh, and some of whom were uh, feminist congresswomen. There were probably only a half dozen of them, but they were fierce allies with one another. Um, preceding my mother's entry into Congress were, were people like Edith Green uh, and Martha Griffith, most particularly, who uh, was 15 years my mother's senior, in, chronologically speaking, and 10 years her senior in Congress. She was the first elected in 1954. And she sort of mentored my mother initially when my mother arrived in Congress, and they became very good friends. Um, with a lot of uh, sort of common concerns about developing an equality agenda uh, that could be legislated. Uh, Martha Griffiths was most well known in the late 1960s and early 1970s for um, uh, loosening the Equal Rights Amendment from the Judiciary Committee where it had languished for you know, decades. Um, so the sort of whole trajectory of rights um, sort of depended on these sorts of relationships. And then going forward from 1970, uh, but still in that early period, probably her most profound relationship was with Bella Abzug, uh, Congresswoman Abzug, who was elected in 1970 and first served and began to serve in 1971. And uh, they were, um, they were pistols. Uh, together and, and very um, brazen in their approach to getting things done. And they, you know, they, they worked hard uh, in trying to, to, to end the war in Vietnam and they worked hard uh, together for women's equity issues. Right, definitely. I think some of the more powerful kind of images for me in the book are photos of El Abzug um, and your mother kind of together in their efforts against the Vietnam War, looking for peace um, in that sense. And I do have to say that at the New York Historical, we do have one of El Abzug's hats with sort of the pink oh, yeah. <laughs> on it. We do. And we always bring that out when we're talking about sort of the particular power of women's work in, you know, Capitol Hill and other spaces, because there is a pistol, I think is the right word for it. It, right um, to take up space in so many ways um, and to be really a powerhouse. Um, and I guess sort of in terms of what Patsy Mink is most known for as a powerhouse, it would be her work on Title IX, right? Um, which just to define quickly prohibits sex discrimination in any educational program that receives federal funds. Um, and it also happens to be sort of the center of one of the exhibits that we have going on right now at the New York Historical. Um, and so we'd love to just hear from your point of view, you know, why was Title IX so significant a piece of legislation? Um, and can you tell us a bit more about you know, how and why Mink came to be such a fierce advocate for this particular law? Judy, you want to start? <laughs> That was good, that was preemptive. <laughs> um, I mean, I think going back to what I was saying earlier, it's about her, Ming's own experiences of educational exclusion. And it wasn't just her personal experience, but there were efforts to document these types of um, expressions of patriarchy in educational institutions during the 60s, going to the 70s, that it's a systemic practice. And it was something that Wendy herself faced um, Wendy mentioned that when she was applying to college, colleges would write back and say, you know, you look very good, you're very qualified, but we've met our quota for women applicants. So it was much more overt, the type of gender discrimination that women were facing. So Title IX was an, an 
expression or trying trying to utilize this, like, the tools of the law to try to mandate gender equity. Um, and I think Wendy can say more about that. But I did also want to highlight that Petsmink didn't just support Title IX, but she also supported the Women's Educational Equity Act. So Title IX could in some ways be interpreted as a negative right that you, you can't discriminate. Um, but the Women's Educational Equity Act was about providing resources so that teachers can rethink their curriculum. You know, what does it mean to have a gender-free, um, bias, bias-free curriculum? Um, those funds were also used to support women's studies programs and women's centers, right? This is, this is an infusion of resources so that you can really transform the educational setting as opposed to just mandate that discrimination should not take place. Right. My mother's um, my mother's brief against uh, inequality for girls and women in the educational process was sort of went far beyond the question of whether or not they could get into those schools. She was very concerned about how women and girls were treated in the schools. She was very concerned about the kinds of uh, access to uh, academic resources and support that were withheld from women and girls, even when, when they were uh, allowed to enter into uh, schools at all levels. She was uh, very concerned about the socialization of girls and women to um, particular fields that would keep them out of the male track of power, <laughs> basically, and higher pay. Right, and so, and some of these things were based on her own life experience. Some of those things were based on her experience as a mother witnessing her child told that she couldn't run for class president in second grade because a boy wanted the job um, or witnessing her child being told that she had to learn how to play house. She couldn't play cars and, and Legos with the boys in nursery school. She had to play tea party and house with the girls. All of those sorts of things were part of uh, a system, uh, a comprehensive system of uh, gender discrimination and, and women and girls subordination that my mother wanted to address in the educational process. And Title IX didn't get you all the way there. And so the Women's Educational Equity Act for her was um, uh, an extremely important sort of collateral policy that uh, she introduced uh, initially in January of 1973, so just six months after Title IX was uh, enacted, that would have, would have had it been fully funded, uh, sort of permitted the overhaul of instructional materials at all levels of education, um, opened up math and sciences decades before uh, the STEM awakening of the, of the 21st century um, and so forth. Right, that's really fascinating. And I, I guess I do have a quick follow up question, which is, you know, why do you think Title IX is what then she's most known for? You know, is it because it was the one that kind of made it through? Is it because of it, the fact that it's a negative right? Kind of just a little bit more context on why you think that is sort of the flagship of her biography in a lot of ways. Well, Title IX was a tremendous success, mm -hmm. right? It, it did permit us to force open doors. Right, it was a lever, it was a tool that was given to girls and women who, if they know about it, can deploy it and can make change. They can't make all kinds of change. They can't guarantee access across the economic spectrum to women and girls to schools. That's not what Title IX can do, but it certainly changes the balance of, uh, of participation uh, in the educational process. And, and it was enacted, it was sustained against numerous attacks uh, over the decades as early as 1975, but also in the 80s and in the 90s and uh, in the 2000s. Um, and it is associated in the public imagination with visible um, sort of championship, right? Which is that of athletics. And so um, it's, I think it's natural to gravitate to when you're thinking about somebody's legacy, it's natural for people to gra gravitate to something that is uh, recognizable, which athletics certainly does for Title IX, and to something that was 
enormously successful, which nobody can deny Title IX was in uh, opening access and opening opportunities to girls and women at all levels of, of schooling. But I th I'm not sure what the the sort of uh, underlying question is that you're you're um, suggesting, but uh, or or point that you might be suggesting. But what I would take away from your question also is uh, sort of a caution to remember that there's a lot that people fight for and about that they don't necessarily win on that are equally important, right? So her fight for childcare, for comprehensive universal childcare in the late 1960s and early 1970s went down to flaming defeat when Richard Nixon vetoed the legislation in 1971. But it was an important fight and it's you know, it's a, an important and indelible part of her legacy. Uh, similarly, the Women's Educational Equity Act that we were just talking about was passed, but it was never fully funded. And so it was not, it never sort of realized, the, the, it never met its vision, right? But it was also an important, it's an important sort of element of the basket of, of requirements to accomplish and propel uh, the idea of equality forward uh, within the the universe of, of education. I was just going to add two things. One is that there's this fantastic short documentary that was recently released on the New York Op Doc website, and it's by Ben Proudfoot, who uh, won an Academy Award for Queen of Basketball, and it features my co-author Wendy Mink um, on this very um, dramatic episode in the defense of Title IX. So I encourage everybody to watch it. It's so well done. And Naomi Osaka is the executive producer for the film. So I'm getting all sorts of you know, fangirl, um, I'm giving all sorts of fangirl <laughs> energy with that. <laughs> um, but the other thing I just want to mention when Wendy was talking about, you know, how to remember the past and how victories tend to be foregrounded. One of my favorite quotes, which is in a documentary about Patsy Mink called The Head of the Majority, is when she says, you know, I've run many times and I've lost many times. And not only did she run many times, but she also advocated for a variety of policies, some of which uh, were passed and some were not. Um, but she said, you know, I've never lost the belief that I as an individual and you as an individual can make a difference. So I think that persistent um, desire to battle, <laughs> right? The persistent desire to advocate for, for justice is something that is so powerful. Um, and I think that should be remembered. I remember talking to Wendy, and then maybe this dovetails with your next question about intersectionality, that when um, Patsy Mink and others were trying to advocate to protect welfare in the 1990s and to really advocate for the solving of poverty, not to, not to eliminate welfare, but to think about how do you solve poverty, they knew that they did not have the votes to pass what they saw as a as a better set of policy for the, for the lives of poor women and children. Um, and I remember asking Wendy, like, why do they continue? And Wendy was pointing out, it's so important to have this record of opposition. Because I think looking back on the past, there's a tendency to justify whatever has happened as if there were no other options available. And so having that record of opposition of alternative ideas of different political possibilities is something that is so important for us um, as a society as we think about our future, right? What are the possibilities as opposed to narrowing them down to just what were the, you know, six, what were the laws that were passed? Right, exactly. And I think that's why it's so fascinating and wonderful to have the make papers in the archives, right? Because you can sort of see the ways in which she's working through and collaborating and trying out these different strategies. And that in and of itself is really significant, right? That these were ideas that were being pushed for at that time and continue to kind of inform political strategy making today. And that does sort of lead as well into my next question, which is, you know, Patsy Mink was deeply committed to issues of racial and economic justice, as well as environmental protections. And so, you know, how did Mink's commitment to these issues interact together um, in terms of her work on women's rights and gender equity, especially, um, but sort of how did all of her different um, political engagements sort of network throughout her time on Capitol Hill? Well, I think that the economic justice, civil rights, and feminist 
uh, commitments all sort of converge most clearly and neatly in the welfare uh, mm -hmm. issue in the 1990s, uh, where you know, it was a situation in which the majority of her own party um, was uh, hell-bent on quote unquote, ending welfare as we know it um, through policy initiatives that uh, were deeply disrespectful and subordinating and disciplinary of poor mothers. Um, so in other words, welfare reform was going to take place and did take place through the uh, extinction uh, or weakening of the rights of low-income mothers, basically, so that we ended up with a caste system of, uh, you know, some mothers who enjoyed the privileges of uh, reproductive justice, who enjoyed the privileges of uh, being able to choose their vocation ended up with the privileges of being able to choose how to, how to form their families. Uh, on the one hand, those, those were the women who were not touched by welfare reform. Uh, and then inside welfare reform, we have a whole population of, of women, mostly of color, who um, are highly regulated um, and uh, really coerced in, in, in many respects uh, with, uh, uh, with reference to reproductive freedom, to association with uh, uh, men who might be biological fathers of their, their child or children and so forth. So that's kind of where um, everything came together because her vision of uh, an appropriate welfare policy was one in which a safety net was generously preserved and in which there was lots of educational opportunity and support for the pursuit of education for low-income mothers who found themselves in need of welfare assistance. Um, there, there would be um, sort of wage uh, uh, consciousness um, instead of workfare. There would be sort of an attempt to make sure that, that at least a minimum wage was offered uh, if work, work outside the home was going to be required to um, uh, qualify for welfare benefits, where uh, anything that was being given to fathers would also have to be given to mothers because it was a great imbalance in that respect as well uh, that was uh, enacted in the, uh, in the package of, of welfare reform. So that, that is one place in which I think racial justice, economic justice, and justice for, for women um, come together. The environment is a slightly different story, but there too, it's intersectional. And Judy actually can talk more about that with probably with respect to uh, indigenous issues in Hawaii. You anticipated me, Wendy. <laughs> yes. But I was thinking about um, the efforts that Patsy Mink engage in to stop nuclear testing, which is um, very much connected to her location and awareness of the Pacific, just given the amount of testing that happened in the so-called trust territories of um, the United States, the Marshall Islands, um, but also in the Bering Straits in Alaska, um, but also her general awareness of, of militarization across the Pacific, um, including her home islands, the, the use of Kaulaue as a bombing site, a bombing target site, um, the use of chemical war well, um, warfare techniques. Um, and here you really see her partnering with indigenous activists because as these tests are happening um, in the midst of the war in Southeast Asia, indigenous activists are engaging in movements for um, cultural and political sovereignty. And so they're making demands about the reclination of places like Kaulaue. There's this really beautiful letter by a group of Kapuna's um, spiritual elders. And they talk about how it's so important for them to visit Kawalawe, this island um, that's very close to Maui, um, in which the military had been using as a bombing site. And they talked about how the spirit of their community is there, like the mana, um, the placentas of their of their multiple generations is buried there. That there's a whole different worldview about that land 
um, as opposed to seeing it as a place just for these military exercises. And they asked Patsy Ming to translate this to the US military. They said, that, you know, we think you can understand and that you can help advocate for us, which she did, she did try. Um, but I just thought that appeal was so powerful that they see her as someone who could be an advocate, who could help support them and who can understand the worldview in which they're coming from. Definitely, I mean, I would love to hear more about, sort of you mentioned this earlier, Judy, about her sort of grassroots activism and how that sort of functioned in her political work. And so, you know, that sounds like an example of grassroots activism in, um, in practice. And so hearing more about that element of her work. Yeah, I think she was um, deeply committed to the principle of self-determination, and that was her stance about Vietnam as well, um, but also with Native Hawaiian groups. Um, there, there's correspondence between Patsy Mink and then um, some of the groups that she's in conversations with, and she'll say, well, what is it that you would like to be, like to introduce, right, in terms of policy? And sometimes she'll even say, well, I'm not sure I agree with that, but I think you have the right to have a hearing. Right, you need to have, you have the right, you should have the right to have your voices represented in Congress. Um, so, you know, her project of advocating for statehood and having an equal, um, equal role in the United States is a project that you can describe as civil rights. And some Native Hawaiian activists have argued that that's reinforcing, right, US empire because there's not the possibility of being outside the US state. But I think there was some overlap between those projects and she was trying to play that role of being an ethical um, ally at being an ethical representative to try to advocate for perspectives that would um, perhaps eventually lead to um, reinstatement of land, right? Kind of recognition of the US takeover of Hawaii. Um, so there were possibilities of that type of dialogue. Definitely. I am also thinking in terms of the question of legacy, right? One of the reasons that brings us all together today is that it is the 50th anniversary of Title IX's enactment. Um, and so one question that I had, um, and I'm looking through a Q&A as well, people are also asking, you know, is in what way do you sort of see Patsy Mink's legacy, whether or not that's how she built political strategy, her partnerships, or her particular legislative achievements that still inform kind of the ways in which women or politicians in general are, are operating in Capitol Hill. So in short, you know, what do you sort of see as her legacy today? Do you want to begin, Wendy, or do you want me to do that? Why don't you begin? Um, I had the privilege of visiting the Capitol twice this year, and both times it was because of Wendy. <laughs> so um, Nancy Pelosi invited Wendy to be a featured speaker for Women's History Month, in which Billie Jean King was also invited. And then just in June, there was a 50th anniversary celebration of Title IX. That was also orchestrated by Speaker Pelosi, but also Asian American, um, the Asian Pacific American Caucus. So um, what really, a couple things that really struck me that some of these individuals had served with Patsy Mink when she was still in Congress. And so there's a great um, affirmation of her political vision, her political partnership. Speaker Pelosi said that Patsy Mink was someone who's not gonna take no for an answer <laughs> of their political commitment. Um, and it wasn't just Speaker Pelosi. I remember the first event I was in the audience, I, I kept on hearing kind of like, yes, yeah, you know, all this affirmation and it was Maxine Waters, <laughs> right? So these are people who were in Congress with her and are still there, right? They're still providing political vision and leadership and they're being joined by younger generations of activist congressional representatives. Um, and um, yeah, so that legacy is still there. Um, Oh, there was something else I wanted to share. Um, maybe I'll come back to, maybe I'll, I'll remember when I, when I, when you come back to me, but I'll, I'll pass it over to Wendy for now. Yeah, I don't, um, I guess I don't really know how, quite how to answer that question. I mean, there, there are her colleagues who are still there, who remember her vividly 
and many of whom are carrying on the same struggles that they collaborated around. Uh, Congresswoman Waters and my mother worked together on welfare issues, for example, in the uh, early and, uh, well, all through the 1990s. Um, and, uh, you know, folks who work together on environmental issues and things like that and stopping um, honoring people who engage in nuclear tests in the Pacific and um, as they did in the late 1990s. Um, so in the sense that there are people there who remember her and who joined the struggles of the 90s against neoliberalism, basically the progressive struggles against the neoliberal juggernaut that was the Clinton administration. Um, um, you know, there's a, there's a legacy there, there's a remembrance there. Um, there's also a legacy, it's not really a legacy, it's a, it's, a, it's a lamentable situation in that so many of the issues that she worked on in the 90s um, have yet to be resolved, right? We still don't have justice for low-income mothers. Uh, we still don't have wage equity that would raise the floor for the lowest paid workers. We still don't have an increased minimum wage. We still don't have uh, you know, guaranteed resources for education and training. Um, all, of, you know, all of those sorts of um, things that she was fighting for in the 1990s have yet to be fully accomplished. Bits and pieces are you know, in different policies and so forth um, have been, uh, that's been accomplished over the past 20 years. But um, the, you know, I guess, uh, it's too bad that her voice is no longer um, available to uh, participate in the debates that we need to be having, that we are having, um, but that have yet to resolve in the favor of uh, social justice. I remember now what I wanted to share. <laughs> So that, that documentary, one of the documents I mentioned is called Ahead of the Majority. And that phrase is from when Patsy Mink ran unsuccessfully for the Senate. And I love that political vision, which is that you can't wait for something to become popular before you advocate for it. You have to be ahead of the majority and then to be willing right, to be the first one, going back to the question of first, right, to advocate for a position. And um, I think that spirit of bravery is something that Patsy Mink exhibited throughout her political career. I remember finding different instances where her husband said, I don't know, maybe this is the death knell, right? She did something that was really bold and out there and is she gonna not be able to be reelected because of this? And um, I think we need that, that political courage. Um, and I think that is one of the legacies for me, for Pat Mink. Definitely. Thank you both for those really beautiful answers. And I definitely understand the fierce and fearlessness of the title a lot more after speaking with you. I'm going to transition a little bit more to Q&A now. Um, we've been having some questions flooding in. Um, and so one of them I actually think goes quite nicely with uh, sort of Judy's mention of um, the letters and sort of the personal correspondence element of this research. And so one question that we got was, um, I think directed towards Wendy, which was sort of, what was it like to grow up uh, with Patsy as your mom? What stood out to you about growing up um, in this household? Um, well, as I was growing up, um, I was simply aware that my mother was uh, considered different from other mothers. She was considered possibly negligent uh, because she was doing her thing. Um, she was extremely active. Uh, my parents were active together around all kinds of political issues. There was um, sort of intense discussion uh, and explanation to me um, of various political issues, especially as uh, she had to weigh uh, when to stand up for something where she was going to be the only person doing the standing um, and that sort of thing. So it was, it was um, an illuminating, exciting, uh, very busy household uh, growing up. In retrospect, hard to, hard to 
put a, put a finger on what it was like to grow up in that kind of environment, other than that I know it shaped who I became, right? I, I know that um, I became a person who reflected and analyzed politics rather than entered politics because I saw what happens to people who are so publicly exposed um, as, as my mother was. Um, I know that I grew up to be very committed to um, all kinds of progressive issues, social justice questions, civil rights, women's rights, uh, peace, and so forth, because of the uh, influence of, of the household. I didn't grow up to, to uh, reject it. I grew up to embrace all of those things. Um, but that's about as much as I have uh, consciousness of in a you know, focused way to report. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add a couple of things. I remember, I think one of the questions I asked Wendy was like, well, what was a typical day in your mother's life? And she worked really long hours. Like, you know, she was very well prepared. She did a lot of research. So she took work home with her. Um, but I also love the stories where you said, you know, you like to go shopping together or she ate vanilla ice cream and cheddar cheese sandwiches, I think. <laughs> if I remember the story. cheese, yep. Yeah. Grilled cheese, cheese and ice cream. <laughs> um, so I just, I love those, those details that humanize her. And this is one of my favorite stories about um, their family is just how um, loving and supportive Patsy Ming's husband, Wendy's father was, um, that he um, helped look through some mail to protect her from hate mail. <laughs> um, he would drop her off and pick her up. Um, and that even after she passed away, there's stories about her visiting her grave on a daily basis just so he can talk to her. Um, and it just speaks to such a beautiful relationship that they had and that how close knit their, their family was. Definitely. I really enjoyed those anecdotes as well in, in reading through the book. Um, our next question, I think I might have planted this in my intro, um, but someone would love to know more about um, Patsy's run for president in 1972. So if we could just tell us a bit more about, about that presidential bid. Judy, do you want to do that? I'll be, yeah, I'll begin. Um, so she was in some ways drafted for the presidency by anti-war activists who were based in Oregon. They knew of her political stance and wanted to help provide a platform for her. And so she actually campaigned pretty intensely um, in Oregon. She also appeared on the ballot of a couple other states, but I think she was very disappointed by the, the results of, of her efforts. 72 was such a banner year, so she ran for the presidency. She also traveled to Paris as, um, with Bella Obzug as an attempt to see if they can negotiate or come to a different understanding of the war as, as um, women political activists and women political leaders. And they met with Madame Nguyen Thi Bin, who's arguably the most visible Vietnamese woman um, who was advocating for peace at that time period. She often hosted anti-war activists and she was also there at the Paris Peace Accord to help negotiate. So I think all those things that were happening during 72 was, uh, was just uh, enormously exciting and interesting along with the passage of Title IX. Yeah, the, um, the issue that sort of generated the interest in Oregon uh, to draft, initially it was to draft someone and then they, they zeroed in on my mother and the, the someone had to be someone who was willing to make the war in Vietnam uh, the lead issue in their candidacy. Uh, it, that is ending the war in Vietnam as the lead issue. At the time, the um, person who was understood to be the peace candidate, who was the, who ended up getting the nomination for the Democratic Party, George McGovern, was sort of downplaying the importance of the Vietnam question uh, in national, national uh, political debate. And that was why anti-war forces were so concerned to sort of lift up the issue 
and make sure that voters knew what the stakes were uh, proceeding with the Republican sort of war machine versus uh, trying to find some different alternative to a Democratic contender. Uh, they recruited her in 1971, in the fall of 71. Uh, she filed her papers, I think, in November or December, something like that, of 1971, and spent the period January till the Oregon primary in May uh, spending weekends, basically, uh, on the campaign trail, getting to know Oregon very well. Um, I went on some of those trips. I, I was a surrogate on some of on some occasions, my father was a surrogate. On some occasions, it was a, a very, uh, from my sort of outsider uh, observer position, it was a fascinating experience to be campaigning and interacting with voters in an entirely different milieu, right? I mean, I've been doing campaign work and interacting with the public in Hawaii for my entire life, um, but this was a completely different place. And so, um, that was, you know, that was a, for a budding political scientist, it was a very uh, useful learning experience. That is the perfect segue, actually, to the next question that we had from Q&A, which is just to speak a bit more about the significance of Hawaii as its own sort of geographic and political state. We've talked about sort of the fight for statehood, the indigenous presence as well. Um, so we'd love to hear kind of more about about Hawaii's significance um, in Patsy's career. And this, I think, will have to be our, our last question as well um, of the salon. Well, I think that question is ready-made for Judy. <laughs> um, I think one of the ideas that we talk about in the book is that Patsy Mink was really shaped by her Pacific origins and her awareness of the Pacific. And so, the fact that Hawaii was a territory before it became a state. And that's that's the era in which she grows up in. Um, that she also has an affinity and connection and a sense of commitment to represent other island territories. Um, and so there's been, there's a lot of um, kind of correspondence and dialogue about how she might advocate for equal treatment for US territory islands. Um, I mentioned before kind of her awareness about um, nuclear testing, militarism. Wendy talked about her awareness about labor issues. And I think that really much comes from the plantation society that exists in Hawaii. Um, her awareness of environmental issues more generally growing up in an island environment. Um, so you're much more aware of the weather, the waters, the lands. Um, so, even though much of the story in the book takes place in Washington, DC, I think being from Hawaii and having that worldview really shapes, um, shaped what Patsy Mink was politically committed to. I feel awkward to being the last word on Hawaii though. <laughs> Wendy, are you sure you don't wanna add anything else? No, I think that that's beautiful. Great. Um, and we definitely have a lot more questions coming in. And I will just do a quick plug to say that most of these questions could be answered by reading this beautiful book um, that Wendy and Judy put together. So unfortunately, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but if you'd like an answer, um, we do have a link in the chat for a great place to find them. Um, and so by way of conclusion, I just do want to thank again, Judy and Wendy uh, for being with us today. Um, and to our audience, please do sign up for our mailing list and follow us at nyhistory.org to get the latest on upcoming salons like this one. Finally, the New York Historical Society is currently open on Wednesday through Sunday, and you can reserve your timed entry museum tickets on our website. We hope to see you on Central Park West to view Title IX, Activism on and Off the Field, which is now open in our Joyce B. Cowan Gallery for Women's History through September 4th. So thank you again to everyone here today. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, thank you.